Great. I think that's a, that's a wonderful start, wonderful opening remarks. I'll, I'll turn uh, to Mr. Suresh Prabhu with that. And really, uh, uh, Mr. Prabhu, you are in charge of uh, one very, very critical sector in India. And uh, today, when we talk of India, one of the things that's really putting uh, pulling up India is the entire of infrastructure sector. In India badly needs infrastructure. Uh, many sectors within the infrastructure span is, work, uh, is doing well. Your sector is doing well. And you are requiring international uh, expertise. You are requiring international funding. Uh, uh, and how is your sector, therefore, especially to begin with? And I know, given your capacity and your, uh, your intellect, you go much beyond railways in your thinking. And, uh, and, and I would urge you to do that while you talk, to say that how can India really take maximum advantage and how would you really look at uh, railways in particular, but generally in the infrastructure sector, uh, to Singapore? And you heard uh, what uh, the uh, uh, minister uh, just now talked about, the type of, uh, the type of uh, uh, relationship that one really looks to build upon. So your, your views, Mr. Prabhu. Oh, thank you very much and I would welcome the minister to India again. Thank you for coming. And this is a very interesting conversation we are having on the eve of the visit of a prime minister, which will, I'm sure, seal the deal on many areas to make sure that this age-old relationship it becomes more relevant in the uh, modern times. So we look forward to that. Uh, of course, I fully agree with you. There are several areas in which one can learn from Singapore. Not just India, but Singapore is a uh, shining example of how one should succeed in the most adverse situations. And when you don't have any of your own resources, how do you actually leverage the other resources to develop your own geography? That is something which is a great example. And therefore, it's an inspiration for all developing countries. And of course, an envy of all the developed countries. So we really look forward to learning from you and working with you. Uh, one of the, some of the areas in which uh, uh, railways, for example, you mentioned, of course, knowing the length and breadth of the country, your country, obviously the railway network is not as large, but still you have one of the most efficient public transport system anywhere in the world. And that is, <laughs> <laughs> but extremely efficient public transport. So I think now uh, in the world, we need to learn about how to use more public transport because uh, the greenhouse gas emission which cause all the kinds of problems that we are all facing uh, could be addressed largely by moving away from private transport to public transport. And therefore, in public transport, you have actually shown a way. In that context, I was saying also your other great achievement is in development of a city. How should be uh, urban development take place? So I am very happy that you are participating in some of the smart city development projects. So station development, which is India's one of the big priority, you have 400 railway stations which are, you want to redevelop uh, in the next few years. So one of that area in which I think Singapore can offer a lot of expertise and participation. Secondly, in infrastructure growth, we need a lot of capital. And Singapore is one of the most preferred international destination for the banking and finance. So I think we can use a lot of uh, Singapore-based organizations not just to source capital from Singapore alone, but global capital from Singapore as a destination. In fact, I had a very interesting conversation on this with the Deputy Prime Minister recently, and he also agreed that this could be a great possibility. So I think as far as railways are concerned, these are the two major areas in which we can definitely uh, take part and work together. But also one of the areas which is extremely critical for India is uh, water. And I know, uh, you have been uh, really used to import water from Malaysia. Then again, yeah, and you re-export to them <coughs> and <laughs> after you process it. So I think another very interesting thing is why you could now uh, becoming self-reliant to a great extent is because you are able to capture all the rainwater. So rainwater harvesting is more than 90%. Also you recycle the water, also use uh, everything that is available to do it. I think that is some other area in which we can definitely would like to work with you. And of course, there are many areas of technology, uh, even designing of modern cities and everything else that goes with this. So I think we can really look forward to doing that. And you mentioned about the similarities. So I think 
my name is synonymous with your name prabhu and ishwar are the same in as far as we believe <laughs> so i think there is so much one can do together <laughs> and therefore we really look forward to working with you <laughs> great great uh, uh, <laughs> while i'm tempted to take this discussion towards uh, one very important a- a- issue which was also touched upon uh, on funding but i'd like to change the topic a little bit and really uh, go into both the, our ministers uh, uh, to talk about one very important aspect as i see it and that's on uh, people development and people and we talked about uh, india today faces a big challenge on seeing how it can really make its uh, demography into demographic dividend and uh, over the last couple of years one has seen a renewed focus on on into this entire aspect of skilling and we are seeing a, 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 a huge government mission a private pu- public partnership which has also been very strongly initiated in india to see how we can uh, bring in uh, the demographic challenge into a demographic dividend railways uh, uh, is the high, is the biggest employer and I, and i and my uh, offline discussions with the railway minister i have often talked about training and skilling in the in that entire gamut which is going to be so very critical singapore has done so well and excellent it's a role model for the rest of the world and we look for uh, look or we look up to singapore in its entire skilling ecosystem that it has brought up uh, we'd like to know from you mr minister sir that uh, how do you how do how do you see singapore contributing to this space as also seeing how it can look at this as to be an opportunity also for singapore and i'll turn over to the railway minister to really know about what's really happening in india you know this is uh, really a very interesting opportunity as you can see uh, of course we are also not going to remain young for life but for next 30 years there is a window available where in india's uh, average age will be working age for long time to come at least for three more decades and that particular time the same period uh, particularly in asia most of the countries will be aging considerably particularly japan is already aging china will also have the same problem in the next few years time so probably the opportunities will not necessarily be in terms of exporting a manpower into that country because that something becomes a sometimes very sensitive issue if you want to bring people from other countries and work with your country work permit many issues come up but offering services offshore from this place for example uh, age aging population of japan they would need care so maybe medication can be given but even somebody has to monitor whether the medication is given or not and now you are using robots but that there are limitations so can we not use the potential of indian young population to take care of so many needs which will be required in those countries so that's one area secondly as we can see now mr the, the normally indian population was also participating in the global supply chain particularly in the services sector by mainly doing the back office jobs mm. to begin with that's how it started but now from it has graduated into knowledge outsourcing to a great extent but i can see great opportunities for a country like singapore wherein you have very strategically located you are in asean but also close to the east asia which is also growing pretty fast and also such good relations with almost all the countries in the region so can we not use your technology and india's manpower to also look at servicing the other geographies by creating some niche areas where it is actually needed particularly in the medical sector um, also i mean i'm just thinking aloud also in banking i can see uh, banking as it is evolving now after some time it is going to be completely different including processing of loans processing of information that clients will offer to you somebody has to apply human mind to it that can be done anywhere offshore and can be done so i think there are many areas like this which will emerge and i think if there's a partnership with singapore which has a smaller population with india's larger population but you are great technological advancement and also the evolution that's very important because you understand the value chain pretty well because you evolved as you said earlier from not so developed country to a far developed country you've covered a lot of ground um let me start by uh, talking about the training uh, i think it's important to invest in uh, people 
And education and training is the most important way of enabling their capacity to, to do things that are valuable and also that will create value for themselves and their families and so on. So we, you know, uh, just going back to a comment that uh, Minister Prabhu made earlier, uh, in Singapore, the main resource we've invested in is in our people. So we've really tried to see how we can raise the education level and in particular certain skill sets in order to get uh, our people prepared, not just for the economy of today, but also for possible changes in the future. So if you look at it from that angle, I think in India, skills development and training has to be guided and informed by where the industry development is going to be. Because I think the most frustrating thing, thing for an individual is if you go for a cause, you attend the cause and you come out and there's no relevant job. You know, why did I do this and why did I waste all my time and effort to do that? So in a way, the two are very interlinked. So if, for example, the priority is in the area of manufacturing, then those manufacturing clusters become a very good magnet for trained, skilled manpower. And you've got to find a way to work with the industry there with the education or training providers in order to create the link. That's what we do in Singapore very often. We have a regular, constant dialogue between the industry and our education institutions to make sure they are staying current and the skills that they are in, you know, developing in our people can be applicable in the market. It's also relevant for the public sector. So, by the way, we still import water from Malaysia, <laughs> just for the record. But one of the reasons why we've been able to develop alternative sources of water, whether it's desalination and uh, new water, which is really recycled water, apart from our own reservoirs, has really been uh, the capacity in our public sector, amongst our officials, to understand that we need to have a good set of policies. And one of the most important policies is how you price water. Because if you price it too cheap or too low or you subsidize it, then, you know, the cost of desalination or new water, for example, is a lot higher and it will never be viable. So you have to price it in a way that reflects the true costs and then have policy consistency and sustainability and work with the industry to create the larger environment. So I think this is where I, it's also about investing in capacity building in officials, which we do all the time. And so I think where Singapore and uh, India already are collaborating, for example, in technical skills development, it's a very valuable space. Uh, you know, we are investing quite a lot in some areas. And when you look ahead into a digital economy where almost every sector is going to have uh, some level of Im impact through digitization, then I think getting the population skilled for that, mm -hmm. ready for that is going to be a very important part of it. And I think in the context of India, you already have a very deep IT capability. It's really how that IT capability can be transformed because it's, for example, how do you get a data analytics support for manufacturers? How do you do market analysis and data analytics for consumer businesses? And then use that to drive not just marketing, but actually in product development and strategies. So this is going to be a big area. And I think I agree with you, uh, Minister, that uh, there's a lot of potential to collaborate because at the end of the day, we, we are you know, a very small city uh, and in the scheme of things, we have limits as to what we can accomplish. Uh, but in collaboration with others, both in the private sector and with other countries, we think there's a lot more scope to do uh, you know, in terms of some of these new areas that can be exploited. You, you, I'll pick it up from one of the comments you made about uh, that you are a small city, a city state. And here, what's happening in India, we have 29 states competing with each other. And, and there are, one, we say that there are 29 mini Indias. And uh, many of them are looking at you. And many of them are wanting to work with you. I mean, one outstanding example has been uh, when a new state is being uh, built up in Andhra Pradesh, uh, they have turned to you. And there are many others uh, uh, who are looking at you. And with this competing situation in India, which is a great story for India, actually, that's one of the best things that have happened in India the last two years, is this competition among states, which is really uh, 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 letting the growth story of India go to the states and, and, and giving f some phenomenal results. But for Singapore to focus on, and I'm asking this question to understand, uh, how, would you, how, how would you decide which state to go? I'm not asking about the names of the states, 
but what are those, uh, uh, those competitive indices that you really look at when you decide, yes, Singapore is going to work with this one? So what is it that you are looking at today? A lot of the states are really trying to uh, 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 sharpen their competitive edge, and your, your comments would be very, very important. <laughs> So let me put it this way. We are a small place. We have limited bandwidth and resources. So whatever we do, whether as companies or as a, 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 at the government level, I think we have to be quite clear that we can do this and actually add value. Otherwise, you just spread yourself too thin and you leave a lot of unfulfilled promises. So that's really not a, a very desirable way to move forward. So in designing where and how, I think there are a few, and I would imagine they're quite uh, self-evident. You want to work in, in sectors or in areas where you actually bring a value add that's clear, and that value is appreciated by the counterparty. You want to work in an area where also the, the regulatory and political environment is supportive, so that when you get into, because a lot of this is not in the ideation stage, it's actually in the execution. And it's an execution that you run into all the operational issues, including regulatory compliance and so on. So you need to find ways where there is that support from a regulatory and you know, conducive environment. And then finally, of course, the, the leadership, uh, at the political level, at the government level. So in the context of India, for example, there's strong political leadership at the center. And very many states have embarked on certain ideas. So I think these are all things that you know, any reasonable business uh, would take that into account. But certainly in the context of uh, Singapore, when we look at it, because we want to make sure, because this is, if it's a G2G effort especially, uh, it's got to be one that is well calibrated in order to bring clear benefits and value that both sides will appreciate. You know, we have very limited time uh, uh, at our hand. And I, I'd really like to bring in some of our uh, some of our participants from the floor to take advantage and pose any issues or questions to our two honourable ministers. Anyone from the floor would like to go? Go ahead. Uh, my name is H.K. Agarwal. I'm a chartered engineer. My question is to Mr. Suresh Prabhu. You are thinking of importing uh, railways from Spain. Isn't it possible for you to fund double line? You see, we have, our freight and uh, passenger train are running on single pair of line. You see, it is economical to uh, add another freight corridor like in other countries. Then you can automatically speed up the normal trains instead of, instead of spending on importing trains from abroad. Thank you. It is already, of course, as you, are, as you are aware, there is one dedicated freight, two de dedicated freight corridors which are coming up. Hopefully, we want to complete them in the next three years. But we are also planning three more. So there is going to be connecting the all parts of the country. And in addition to that, as you mentioned, we are also thinking of going beyond the borders. So that's something which is inevitably has to happen over a period of time. So already we are connecting our neighbors. We are already Bangladesh. We are already starting a connectivity with Nepal, we are discussing it at a very advanced stage. Probably with Myanmar, we might go ahead with that. And we have already got some connect with other countries. So what we plan to do is, of course, there is a very ambitious program of United Nations, which is connecting Europe and Asia through roads. There's already a connection. In fact, some trains go from Asia to Europe. There's already a regular cargo service, which is running between Germany and China. So there's already connection, but there is going to be a better and bigger ambitious program. So I hope we'll also be part participating in that overall. Good. Is there anyone else? Yes, deputies. There's a mic on your table. <laughs> uh, Deep Kapuria. There is, uh, what has evolved in Singapore is that over time it has also become a hub for startups. And specifically the tech startups. And we see a lot of our own youngsters converging to Singapore in many ways, not only to access capital, but in other sense as well, because of the ecosystem. And it's literally competing vis-a-vis, -vis, we call it the London uh, ecosystem or even the Berlin ecosystem. 
So I think this is one of the points which our government and prime minister has been focusing on startups. And we see in our recent past that uh, there's a huge surge, upsurge of the startups coming up. And uh, Singapore has also established itself through sovereign funds, which in many ways is helping fund a few of the projects. Can we focus something on the startups and how can we learn more? Uh, this will be a question to both of you. Thank you. Well, the startup space is a very broad space, so it depends uh, where you're focusing. But uh, I'm glad you think that Singapore is a good place for startups, mm -hmm. but it's something that we are continuing to work at. Part of the reason that it needs uh, regular and consistent effort is because uh, if you take, for example, a, a, a space like fintech, Fintech is not just about the technology or some clever algorithms. Uh, you know, this is an important part of the, the value proposition. But it has to be married with a regulatory environment that allows the startup to test out the ideas uh, and in a controlled uh, setting, if possible, from a regulator's point of view, so that they can validate uh, what they're doing before it can be commercially scaled. If you look at it from a regulator's perspective, uh, in, in fintech, for example, they have to find the balance between maintaining the system stability, because fundamentally they're accountable for the financial system stability, and then uh, at the same time allowing for these kinds of innovations, which if you lose sight of them, they might completely disrupt your existing players in this space. So I think what Singapore offers is a, a, a destination or a venue where many ideas can be curated. And we want to see how we can continually make that attractive. So it's capital is one side of it. But quite frankly, I think it's more than capital. It's really about the enabling environment for the ideas to be taken to practical outcomes and to see whether, because you know, uh, as they say, you want to fail fast and fail smart, right? So you want to know very quickly whether an idea works or if it doesn't work, you want to be able to learn from that failure and then apply it to the next solution. So that's really the context of a lot of the work. So I would say, you know, if you're talking about collaboration between uh, India and Singapore, and I know in India there's uh, some very uh, notable efforts to promote the startup space, uh, and I've been tracking that as well. I would say actually the potential really is it's more about uh, collaboration because I think if you're trying to do something, for example, in a... Uh, I'm using fintech again because it's a good example. You can do it in cybersecurity elsewhere. You know, it doesn't make sense to talk about a cybersecurity solution that works in Singapore or in America because these must be global solutions, which means you need the connectivity and the link up in order to be able to work in different jurisdictions and make it and test it out. So I think the potential really is for collaborative innovation and to see how, for example, if you're a startup in India, you may want to see if you can create a, a, a platform in Singapore so that you can test it out across two or maybe other uh, more jurisdictional uh, areas and so on. So I think that's really where the most important space is uh, for startups and innovation. And the capital, I think, will follow that quite naturally. Once they know that this is where uh, projects are being developed and companies are growing, that's what will happen. No, no. I, in fact, I agree with you fully. Typically, if any established player has to look at how good is a startup, he's going to say it's worse because he's going to be out of the business soon mm -hmm. when the startups come to four. So therefore, what really government should do is to create this enabling environment. What Singapore and India could do probably is even startup needs scaling up. And at that time, probably a bigger platform, bigger visibility, acceptability, providing the angel funding as well as venture capital funding, all of that, which, which in fact, one of the reasons why Silicon Valley is the most successful place to have startup is because the entire ecosystem is in place there. So I think probably such types could be made in which ecosystem need not necessarily be confined only to one country. Maybe some part of that ecosystem can be done in Singapore. And that is something which we should really look at. But the startup being normally, not always, but most of the time, being very disruptive in nature, that they try to 
disrupt the existing businesses substantially. Therefore, getting anybody saying that whether it's my idea is a good idea is going to know it's not a good idea because he said, firstly, if it's a good idea, I'm going to think I'm a successful person. Why I didn't think myself if it was such a good idea? So therefore, we must, as he correctly said, we should be providing enabling environment mm. to take it to a fore. And probably it is a very good idea to collaborate with Singapore on this because they are certain institutions which are so strong, globally respected. You have a system in which enterprise is fully allowed to blossom. And I think that's something we should try to take advantage of. I suppose we are trying to move on to the chain of uh, doing ease of doing business substantially. We are also trying to improve our standing in terms of competitiveness, but still long way to go as compared to Singapore. So probably a startup in India could take advantage of that ecosystem available within Singapore and we can collaborate. Great. Yeah, any any last one, last question. Yeah, my name is Suvash Goyal. Specifically uh, to Mr. Prabhu, is there any uh, specific uh, collaboration that has taken place between Indian Railways and Singapore? Uh, any projects which are uh, have are in the pipeline or about to be executed, or is there a time frame or is there something maturing? You know, it's Singapore. As I said, you know, there are many areas which will go just beyond one sector. For example, infrastructure financing is one area in which we need the paper which is required, the instrument, financial instrument, which has to be long term in maturity, which must have a appetite which will people will only understand like pension funds and others. So Singapore being a home to many of these global pension funds, global even sovereign wealth funds operate from there, and it's also a recognized and respected financial market. I think that's one area. Secondly, on the real estate development, the city development, urban development, Singapore is acknowledged leader. So I think there again we can collaborate. So we have been having discussion. I'm sure uh, soon we'll take this relationship to a new level. Tomorrow, uh, both prime ministers will be meeting. So I think they will also take it forward. But I'm very happy that we have uh, Honorable Minister here to prepare for that particular dialogue and I think we can really take it forward. We are just having some conversation and it is definitely possible knowing each other's strength and also the requirement that there is so much can be accomplished. So I would just add, I think uh, you got to look at it both in terms of verticals or spaces where we can do things together. So whether it is smart city type of ideas, and when you say smart city, what does that mean? So it can mean uh, water solutions, it can mean certain types of transport engineering solutions and it can also mean, you know, talking specifically about Mr. Prabhu's uh, portfolio for example, the railway plan uh, and I know there's an emphasis on transport oriented development around the nodes and whilst our MRT system is uh, much smaller than yours but the principles are the same because it's really about how you leverage the volume of traffic, people traffic and the footfall and turn that into an opportunity in terms of uh, developments that will complement that and take advantage of that and create value uh, for, the, for the city and also for the businesses that are engaged. So I think that's an important area uh, and there are I think many others we can talk about. So the verticals and specific opportunities are important and I think in the area of financing, um, I think Singapore can be a, a good valuable source of uh, investment and funds flow into India in terms of some of these priority sectors. Because it's not just about where the pools of funds are, it's also about having the knowledge and the connectivity to be able to, you know, make the linkages and have the funds channeled appropriately to get the best possible outcomes from an investor's point of view and from the host country's point of view, channeled to where the needs are greatest. So I think that's where uh, locations or, you know, in the case of uh, India, the partnership with Singapore, I think, can be quite valuable because you already have a very strong base from which we can, you know, in terms of mutual understanding that can be used for some of these other activities. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was a, a great uh, overview of how we could collaborate further between our two countries, how we can strengthen, the, uh, strengthen our collaboration. We saw in each of the new missions that one has seen in the last two years that has come up in India, from Make in India to a Digital India to, uh, to a even Swachh Bharat, to all of it that, that one sees, 
and, and, and our focus in areas like infrastructure, people building, we see a great role that we can have uh, between our two countries, especially Singapore's collaboration with India. We, and, and, and this coming in the eve of the discussions that we all look forward to tomorrow, uh, I think uh, is, is, of, uh, is of great, great, great value to our both, both our countries and specifically to uh, both our businesses. And we have indeed a very strong team that has come from the Singapore uh, uh, business, uh, dele uh, uh, as a Singapore business delegation. And the type of uh, business to business discussions that we have had uh, has been truly very exciting. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up this part of the uh, this part of the evening as we have some MOUs also to be conducted by thanking our uh, two uh, two honourable ministers for participating with us. But before I do so, I'll I'll request Mr. Suresh Prabhu and then Mr. Ishwaran to give any last quick comments that you might have in uh, as we wrap this evening up. As I said, the potential of this relationship is huge. I would feel that we are not even sky the surface. So much can be done together between Singapore and India bilaterally and with Singapore as a partner with multilaterally with several countries in the region in a very significant way. So I think the opportunities are immense and luckily the understanding between Singapore and India is phenomenal. There is one country who understands India probably as good as anybody else is uh, Singapore. So I think we are very happy that you are here and we look forward to working with you. And with Singapore, we can do many things. I remember your former Prime Minister saying that there are two wings to an aircraft. One is India, one is China. So we have to fly. So that's what you believe in. So I think now we are really on the way to uh, take a high trajectory of growth. And in such time, Singapore as a partner would really help us a great deal. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much. I would just uh, sit on. Yeah. Yeah. I would just add, we start from a very strong foundation in terms of the relationship between the two countries. Whether you take it at the political level, which is very strong mutual understanding, and our prime minister's uh, visit, which starts officially tomorrow, and uh, Prime Minister Modi visited us last year, uh, these are part of the ongoing high-level engagement that we have, and it's a reflection of the strong ties politically and also at the business level and at the people people level. I think the next point I would make is I think there are good opportunities for both sides to work together on. Uh, those opportunities are defined by, on the one hand, India's priorities and areas of emphasis in policy and in the way your economy is evolving. It's also defined by, I think, where Singapore's capabilities are and some of the developments in our own uh, part of the world in terms of Southeast Asia and Asia, which creates opportunities for Indian businesses as well. And thirdly, I would say the way forward really is focusing our efforts. So in the conversations with the government ministers and, and agencies, I've emphasized that it's important to take, for example, the idea of smart cities and break it down into specific areas where the two parties can then engage at a more detailed level. And I think that is where the two business communities also can play a very important role because you focus on the opportunity specifically and turn them into action. And I think that's where we should be putting a lot more of our effort as we look ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to the next session. Thank you. I have the privilege to announce the three MOUs that are being signed now. The first one is between the... Confederation of Indian Industry and the Singapore Business Federation for enhancement of business relations between India and Singapore. May I request Ms. Shobna Kamineni, President-designate CII, and Mr. S.S. Theo, Chairman, Singapore Business Federation, to please come and do the honors. A brief background, the Singapore Business Federation, SBF, is the apex business chamber championing the interests of the Singapore business community in the areas of trade, investment, and industrial relations. It represents 22,500 companies, as well as key local and foreign business chambers. CII is an industry-led and industry-managed organization, playing a proactive role in India's development process. Founded in 1895, India's premier business association has over 
8,000 members from private as well as public sectors, including SMEs and MNCs, and an indirect membership of over 200,000 enterprises from around 240 national and regional sectoral industry bodies. Please join me in congratulating them. The second MOU is between Singma's Management Services Limited, SMSL, and Apollo Logi Solutions Limited. The signatories for this, again, are Mr. SSTO, Director of M SMSL, and Mr. R.K. Gupta, CFO, Apollo Logi Solutions Limited. May I request Mr. Gupta and Mr. Tio to kindly do the honors. Singmas is a subsidiary of PIL Group. It is a leading manufacturer of containers, operators of terminals, and container depots and provider of logistic services. Apollo Logis Solutions Limited in India is engaged in the business of offering complete and comprehensive logistic services relating to container freight stations. The third and final MOU to be signed is between Pacific International Lines and Apollo Logi Solutions Limited on containers freight stations in India. The signatories, Mr. SSTO, Managing Director of PIL, and Mr. R.K. Gupta, CFO, Apollo Logi Solutions Limited. Pacific International Lines Group in Singapore operates a range of maritime related businesses spanning from international shipping, containers manufacturing and other logistic services. <laughs> Apollo Logi Solutions is engaged in the business of offering complete and comprehensive logistic services relating to container freight station, inland container depots, freight forwarding, custom brokerage, warehousing, and allied services. And with that, we come to the close of the three MOUs. Can we hear it for all the three of them, please? May I now request Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, Director General CII, to present a token of appreciation to Mr. S. Ishwaran, Minister of Trade and Industry, Government of Singapore, for being here with us. May I now invite Mr. SSTO, Chairman SBF, to present a memento to, Ms. Memento to Mr. Suresh Prabhu, Minister for Railways, Government of India. May I now request Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, Director General CI, to present a memento to Mr. SSTO, Chairman SBF. <laughs> I invite Mr. SSTO, Chairman SBF, to present a memento to Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, Director General CII. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to a close of this session. May I invite, to close the session, 
Mr. Gautam Banerjee, Vice Chairman SBF and Chairman and Senior Managing Director, Blackstone Singapore, to please come and give the vote of thanks. His Excellency, Mr. S. Ishwaran, Minister for Trade and Industry of the Government of Singapore. His Excellency, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, Minister for Railways of the Government of India. Esteemed friends from uh, the Confederation of Indian Industries, uh, members of the Singapore uh, Business and Official Delegation, good evening. We've come to the end of a short but uh, substantive and punchy Singapore-India Business Forum. Uh, it's very interesting that um, the sessions, both the, um, the panel that we had uh, featuring uh, business leaders from Singapore and India, and the, uh, the discussion that we've just concluded featuring uh, uh, two, of, uh, two leaders, one from Singapore and one from India, actually uh, talked about similar things. I mean, the very long, close, and warm relationship between the two countries, which has been built on very pragmatic uh, and uh, for, for pr on pragmatic basis and for mutual uh, benefit and cooperation. Uh, which and which has withstood the test of time. It's, it keeps growing, and uh, events like this, where we have uh, business delegations visiting from one country, uh, me uh, memorandums of understanding being signed, which deepens collaboration, deepens the uh, uh, the working level arrangements between the two countries, and takes this relationship to even higher levels. So I think uh, you know we've uh, we've also over the years uh, seen the um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the relationship moved to, the, to higher levels, and I think the, uh, the, the signing of SICA uh, uh, 10 years ago, the double tax treaty, these were all facilitators uh, to help the, uh, you know, the relationship grow, uh, uh, both at the political level as well as the uh, relationship between, the, uh, uh, between companies and opportunities between companies to, uh, to work with each other. Well, as you know, uh, uh, SICA is being, uh, is being amended. Um, uh, the, the Double Tax Treaty needs to be uh, also reviewed because it was built on the India-Mauritius uh, 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 Treaty, and that treaty has been revised. Uh, but I would urge uh, the leaders of both countries uh, to, uh, to bear in mind this very close relationship, uh, which has uh, benefited uh, uh, the, uh, both countries, to bear that in mind when SICA is negotiated and where the double tax treaty is, uh, is, is being negotiated because there could be unintended consequences uh, arising from uh, changing things which have worked very well. You know, I think we have uh, two very eminent ministers and even though Mr. Uh, Prabhu is uh, Minister for Railways, I know he's a chartered accountant, I've dealt with him before and he understands finances and business very well. Um, and you know, uh, uh, what's, happened, uh, what ha what's happened in the last few years is that Singapore has built up a, a community, um, and this is not just Singaporean companies, but global companies who have used Singapore as the place from which uh, business and investments have come into Singapore uh, and to India. And uh, you know, the, um, that ecosystem uh, may be jeopardized if we kind of change things which have worked well. So I hope that uh, you take that into account. Um, that's my. Uh, real plug for this evening. Uh, I've been doing this for a while, but I think it's, it's something which is very important. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you change things and then, you know, you realize that that, uh, that momentum that you've built up suddenly disappears. So, uh, uh, ministers, please, uh, I know you'll do your very best and uh, I just urge you to do that for the business community. Um, I now have just uh, uh, the task of thanking the two leaders to have you know, for you to have spent some time with us. Uh, I think this uh, really capped off uh, this, uh, uh, the, the business forum. Um, and also the panelists earlier, who were uh, very uh, forthright and uh, you know, shared their experiences. And, uh, uh, and I think it was a very robust uh, discussion. Uh, I would also like to thank um, uh, Standard Chartered uh, Bank for uh, being the, the sponsor of this uh, forum. To our friends at CII for organizing this, let's give them a round of applause. And, and finally, to all of you, uh, you know, to have spent this afternoon and evening with us uh, and to have made this uh, forum so successful. Have a good evening, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen.